can open with me to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, we're going to just begin reading in verse number 1. It says, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they were down to they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came to a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas the magician, that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit, Villainy. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him. He went about seeking who could believe him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed, and when he saw what had occurred, he was astonished. You know, we've been tracing our way uh, through this book of Acts and noting how Jesus is continuing his work now that he has ascended to the Father and sits at the right hand of glory. Uh, but his work was not finished, and he continues this work by building a church and sitting as head over this church. And as we trace this history, this work of Jesus in times past, he's not only drawn himself of people together to become the church, but that church has now begun to spread out. It is reaching other lands and other areas, and the church, the, the focus where we are this morning is in Antioch. So if you've been with us the last few weeks, uh, we, we saw Antioch back in chapter 11, and the church kind of explodes. It takes off in this Gentile-dominated region. And then they send Saul and Barnabas to Jerusalem because of a famine. And that's where we get chapter 12, this little issue that arises where Herod tries to annihilate Christianity and kills James and wants to kill Peter, but God intervenes. The church continues to grow in power. And the very last verse of chapter 12 says that Saul and Barnabas return to Antioch. So the focus shifts back again to this church in the Gentile land. What, we are, what we're going to see in this passage is, is this church catching the missionary heart of God. And I phrase it that way very intentionally because, uh, and we'll, we'll work our way just kind of backwards through that phrase for just a moment, the missionary heart of God. What does that mean? When we talk about the heart of somebody, we're, we're, what, what we're talking about is driving at what drives them. What is the motivation? What is the passion? What is the love? What, what are they driven to be and to do? We talk about God having a missionary heart. That might sound strange. Isn't it? In modern perception, uh, God is either angry and judgmental or he's just kind of wishy-washy and, and, and always nice, the doting grandfather kind of thing. But we get these passages uh, all the way back in Genesis chapter, three, chapter 12, verse number 3. God says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. God calls out Abraham, I'm going to make you a nation, Abraham. And out of that promise, the heart of God is set on the nations. Fast forward to the Old Testament, to Isaiah chapter 19. 
God says the Lord might the Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my heritage. Let me just stop and ask you. When was the last time you looked at Egypt and went, That is God's people? And yet God says, in the Council of Ways, that that heart is fixed. Get Acts chapter 1. Go into all the world. There the message of this gospel is preached. There is in God a heart that beats nations. You want to be really glad about that. Because if it did not, we would not be here this morning. We would be of all men most miserable. God has a heart for the nations. In this chapter, I say that the church catches this heartbeat of God for mission. Because it's one thing to kind of know the heart of someone, right? You might get to know somebody, maybe a spouse, or maybe a a child, or maybe uh, someone that you just get to know in the church. And the more you get together, the more you meet, the more you talk, you're getting to understand what makes that person tick. Oh, man, food and football, right? What more do you need? You begin to know what, what, what that person's heart is all about, what drives them, what motivates them. You start to see it. But it's one thing to see it and to know it. It's another thing to catch it, right? It's another thing to be around someone who has a love for something, they're driven, they're passionate, and all of a sudden you find yourself buying in. You find yourself growing in that same kind of passion. And before you know it, man, you're, you're sucked into it. We talk about a church catching the missionary heart of God. We're talking about not just knowing who God is, though it kind of begins there, right? Like we have to know this is what God is like, but it goes beyond that. It, it, it is God's heartbeat for missions becoming our heartbeat for missions, becoming what drives us, what motivates us, what sets our priorities. Ultimately, it sends us out. It's about catching the missionary heart of God. And as that happens, we're going to see two things. Two, two ideas come along with it. What does it look like when a church begins to catch the missionary heart of God? Two things. Number one, that church will seek. They will speak his word. Seek God, they will speak his word. Look back up to number one. They were in the church at Antioch, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Right? This is kind of how missions get started in the church in Antioch. They're getting organized. What we see right off the bat, there are these guys that are kind of in leadership roles, they're teachers and prophets. Teachers, kind of think, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but we talk about teachers and prophets. Think kind of teachers as those who maybe spend a little bit more time in preparation. They're probably speaking uh, from the Old Testament, preaching the gospel, preaching Jesus from the Old Testament, because that's what they had. That was their scripture then, right? And also probably taking the words of the apostles as they relayed the stories of Jesus, and they were studying, and they were putting lessons together, and they were teaching. There was an, an intentionality behind their message. Prophets think maybe a little bit more spontaneous. So the story uh, back in chapter 11 of Acts, Agabus uh, gets this message from the Lord about a worldwide famine that was going to take place. And there's no indication that he planned that, no indication that God told him that ahead of time. He's like, this is what you need to know, this is what you need to tell everyone. This is more direct receiving from God something that was previously maybe hidden. This was the giftedness of the prophets. No doubt their roles overlapped a lot, but what I want us us more to focus on this morning is that here's this church beginning to grow in Antioch. More and more people are being added, and as they grow, 
they get organized. And that's a good thing. Like God intends for there to be organization in his church and, and with his people. He has established that organization. Now, there's not a lot we know about these particular men, except for Saul and Barnabas. Like we've kind of gotten to know those guys. But there are two things that kind of jump out when you, when you look at these names, and we don't know a lot of detail about them. Two things that kind of stand out about this group of names. One is this African mission. Right? You say, what do you mean? If you were to flip back to Acts chapter 11, verse number 20, it says this. There were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene. If you remember way back when, when we talked Cyrene is in northern Africa. So there were men from northern Africa who came to Antioch. They traveled across the Mediterranean to the north, to Antioch. And what they do? They spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. This is not missions to Africa, but missions out of Africa, right? Missions from Africa to Antioch. And now there are two guys in this list who quite possibly were part of that African mission. One of them is named Simeon, called Niger. Now we're reading a little bit into this, and the reason I say he might be from Africa is because the Latin term Niger means black. So it is possible this is a man from Africa, traveled there in Acts chapter 11 to be part of this mission out of Africa. You say, well, how did there get to be the gospel in Africa so early so they're already sending missionaries out to other parts of the world? Well, uh, there's this other man named Lucius of Cyrene, right? He was from Africa. There's another man in the New Testament who was from Cyrene. His name was Simon. And if you remember in the Gospels, Luke chapter 23, Luke writes about him, that Simon was the guy who was forced to carry Jesus' cross. Right? Simon was from Cyrene. Cyrene is in Africa. So maybe it is that the gospel reached the African continent so early because of this man, Simon, forced to carry the cross of Jesus, at some point comes to terms that Christ is Savior even for men out of Africa and women in Africa. And he returns home with this gospel message. And from there, the gospel catches and church is formed. And before you know it, they're sending missionaries to other parts of the Roman Empire in a very brief amount of time. Regardless, there's this contingency of people serving in the church, leadership in the church in Rome, who were not from Antioch. second thing that stands out about this list is high society. We have an African contingency, an African mission group there now serving the church. By the way, they're serving in the church at Ecclesia. What, what a great mission to get behind and support. And, and I love the fact that these support the crosses because this is exactly what they do. They, they left here. They're not planting a church. They left to go serve in a church. To help lead and teach in a church in a foreign country. High society. There's this guy in this list named Menaean, and it says that he was a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. Uh, Herod, again, part of the ruling family of the Herods uh, that began with Herod the Great. This man, a lifelong friend of Herod, means that he probably grew up with Herod, probably was schooled with Herod, was raised in some way with Herod, uh, and maybe even serves in the court of Herod. By the way, he's a man of high social standing, which means that the gospel had penetrated the ranks of the very family that had sought its extermination on more than one occasion. Here's this man who is a lifelong friend of Herod, is not only converted, but is now serving leadership in the church. Folks, never underestimate the power of the gospel to transform life. To call someone out of high society, to call someone out of the low ends of society. Never underestimate the power of the gospel to penetrate even the most unlikely of heights. And the church has gotten a little more organized. They've got these men who serve as teachers, prophets, leaders, 
it seems like they're starting to ask some questions. They're here. They're a little more organized. We're growing. What now? What now? And we know they weren't simply satisfied to grow large and wealthy because what were they doing? They were worshiping and what? Fasting. Fasting isn't something you do when everything is as it should be. Fasting is something that you do when you recognize an urgent need. It's often seen in Scripture during times of great national crisis or deep sorrow. Those are the times when you are keenly aware of your desperate need for God's help. It's much like prayer in that it's an expression of dependence on the Lord for either forgiveness, deliverance, or direction. But it's in that keen sense of need that the people of God decide for a time to not eat. Why? Well, it's not trying to manipulate God. It's not trying to get God to do what you think he ought to do. It's me expressing maybe a spiritual hunger through my physical hunger. It's expressing my need on the Lord and his help, his deliverance. More than even I need my daily food. Mark chapter 2, verse 19, Jesus says when he's accused, uh, the, the Pharisees come and kind of accuse, ask him about why his disciples don't fast. This is Jesus' answer. He says, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast in that day. But guess what? This is that day. Antioch in the church, that was that day. The bridegroom had been taken away. You don't fast at a feast. It doesn't make any sense. The bridegroom is there. There's celebration. You don't fast at a feast. But the feast is over when the bridegroom is gone. Now the time for fasting has arrived. Why? Because now we know our deep need. He's no longer here with us. We are not in celebratory mode like we were when Christ was here, like we will be when he returns again and we eat in his presence. But now is the time for fasting. Now is the time for being serious about the call of God in our lives. Now is the time to be serious about forgiveness and deliverance and direction. But seriousness, we fast to express our need to God. It is not manipulation. It is not magic. It is helplessness. But what are they so desperate to have the Spirit lead them in? Things seem to be going well. The church is growing. They're getting more organized. Why so desperate? This seems to be the time when churches get comfortable, right? The bank account starts to grow. We build new buildings. We upgrade things. And we just get comfortable. We put things on autopilot. And we run in neutral for a while because there's no pressing urgency. There was no uh, persecution that we know of going on in Antioch at this time. Apparently, finances were fine. Leadership was in place. Numbers are growing. People are good. So why so urgent? Why fasting at a time when things seem to be going just as you would want them to go? Well, we get a little bit of an understanding by looking at the answer that comes to them. What is the answer? What is the outcome of their worship and their fasting? The outcome is the Spirit of God moves in such a way as to prompt them to set aside Saul and Barnabas for a particular work. And that work would be to take the gospel message to the Gentile world. Now, did the church know, did the church in Antioch know that missions was going to be the answer to their worship and fasting? I think they did. I think they did. But they, they had teachers, right? What were those teachers doing? Those teachers were going back into the Old Testament and saying, this is what God is like. They would have doubtless been familiar with the passages that we read at the start of, this, of the message. They would have doubtless been familiar with other passages like Isaiah 49, 6, where God says, is it too light a thing that you should be my servants to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel? I will make you as a light for the nations, that salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. 
no doubt they would have been familiar with the mysteries part of God from the Old Testament. No doubt they would have been reminded by the prophets and by the teachers as they relayed the words of Jesus from John chapter 20, verse 21. When Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Here is a church with seemingly everything going for it, now sitting back and contemplating, what does this mean? Then Jesus says, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. That makes us ask some really important questions, doesn't it? That, asks, that makes us ask some questions uh, about purpose and meaning in this life, about why we exist, why we are left here. Why was Jesus sent from the Father? He was sent from the Father to bear the good news of his own gospel. To bring deliverance to his people. Jesus says, I am also sending you to do what? To bear the same gospel of deliverance to the world. Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. Not, not hey, go into the world and make a good living. This is the entire human effort. No, go into all the world. Make disciples. Whatever God gives you, whatever giftedness you have, whatever, whatever nation you find yourself in, whatever job you find yourself doing, make disciples of every nation. So Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Folks, I believe this is the story of a church beginning to catch the missionary heart of God. With a growing, holy restlessness to be obedient to Jesus and to take the fight to the enemy rather than sitting back in comfort waiting in the fight to come to God. They didn't just run ahead and do busy stuff. They didn't look at the, another church down the street and ask what they were doing to be successful. What did they do? What, what's next for us? They worshiped together and they fasted together. And they prayed together. And the Lord answered with a strategy. The strategy was set aside Saul and Barnabas. And for the first time, the mission to the Gentile world is given a plan. See, up until now, the Gentiles had been reached, but they had they'd been reached here and there, mostly by God's forcing the issue, right? I mean, they, there's this church in Jerusalem, and it starts to grow, and God brings persecution and scatters them, right? Or there are these incidences where God takes Philip and just moves him down, and like, like here's this guy out in the middle of nowhere from a foreign nation, share the gospel with him, right? It's God is just kind of forcefully moving people around in order to get the gospel out of Israel. And now for the first time, the church begins to catch the missionary heart of God. And they're going, how? What does this look like? What do we do? We've never seen it done before. And God is like, these two guys, Saul and Barnabas, set them aside. I've got a job for them. They're going to begin to go through the Gentile world systematically. They're going to take journeys. They're going to bear my gospel wherever they these two men are called out by the Spirit of God, and then they are commissioned by the church. It says, after more fasting and praying, they laid their hands on Saul and Barnabas, and then they sent them to do the work. And when it says they laid their hands on them, so just don't think, again, something weird going on here. We've done this when we, uh, when, when we elected Trevor as an elder or the deacons. We, we lay our hands on you. What are we doing when we, when we do that? This is kind of an identification, right? It's a commission to the task, saying we are with you and we are behind you in full support of what you are going to do. They send these guys off to begin the first missionary journey. I want us to look at three important ideas about missions. Number one. Missions is not our idea, right? This is an important idea. Missions is not our idea. The church in Antioch did not come up with missions. They did not invent it. 
what they did is they, they, they discovered that, that this was a part of God all along. And they discovered that God was drawing them into his heart to use them to accomplish his heart's will. His idea. The gospel was God's idea. Taking that gospel to the ends of the earth was his idea. Incorporating his own people in the spread of that gospel was his idea. Number two, kind of flows out of number one. Mission is not accomplished by our ingenuity or wisdom, but by the Spirit's this ought to make sense to us, right? When we get a hold of the fact that missions was not our idea to begin with, this was God's idea, then what ought to flow out of that is an understanding that we don't just get to do whatever we want to do. It's not just us implementing what we think will work. It's not pragmatism. It is the power of the Spirit that ultimately accomplishes missions. We have all kinds of ideas. And now, on the flip side of that, it doesn't mean that we don't ever think about it, right? It doesn't mean we don't plan. It doesn't mean we don't have a strategy. I don't believe that Saul and Barnabas went down to the port and were like, hey, oh, well, we don't know where we're going. Just first ship available. Oh, I, I think they drew it out. Now, part of the reason I think that this was a bit intentional is they end up, first of all, in Cyprus. Guess who was from Cyprus? Barnabas. Right? Like, that was his home. You don't think there was some conversation about that? Like, hey, Cyprus is nearby. Cyprus is Barnabas' home. Let's start there. It doesn't mean that just because it's God's idea, just because it's accomplished by the work of the Spirit, doesn't mean we don't think about it. It doesn't mean we don't make plans. No, we do. We should be organized. Organization is a good thing. Planning is a good thing. But our hope is never in our organization. It is never in our planning. It is never in our skills. It is ultimately in the power of the Spirit. Number three. Missionaries are chosen by the Spirit, not by us, and not by you. Stop. I don't. I don't believe I chose to become a pastor. That's not how this works. I had a desire that way, but only I don't do that choosing. I would imagine if Jay Cross were here this morning, he would tell you, I didn't choose. I was chosen. What, what we do is not, I get this question way more often than I thought I would get it in, in my other job at jail. The, the question about, um, hey, you know, I, God is really like doing something in my heart right now. I just want to know, what do I need to do to become a pastor? Can you send me material so I can learn and take a test or whatever I need to do? Right? Like, I just, I just feel like it's supposed to be to do something, and it's probably to be a pastor, so, so just point me in the right direction. I was like, well, okay, uh, first of all, um, study the scriptures, right? Let's start there. Know the scriptures. Study 1 Timothy, Titus. Second of all, when you get out of here, go join yourself to a good, solid Bible-preaching church. Why? Because you don't get to choose. Pastor mission. But God gifts people for different tasks. It's our job not to choose. It's our job to identify. Right? It's our job to identify. That's what happened in this passage. The Spirit calls out to He's like, these are the guys right here. They're going to do this mission. What did the church do? Oh, yeah, these are the guys. Right? They simply recognized what the Spirit was already doing. We don't choose our missionaries. They are chosen. We're simply looking to recognize where God is working. Folks, it ought to be a prayer for our, of ours that God would raise up people that he would call out of our church. I mean, we, we, we want to see him grow up leadership inside the church, for the church, but we also want to see him grow up leadership inside the church to go out. Take the gospel message. That is his work, not ours. We ought to be desperate to see him do this work. Folks, I believe this is the reason why the church 
was so desperately seeking God's help. They were invited into the missionary heart of God to work with him to accomplish what his heart desires, and that was the salvation of men, and they were desperate to do it. So they were gathered here to worship him, to work with fasting to get food for the people. God calls out two men. This is where we get to the second point. Church was seeking God's help. The church then, through these two men, were speaking God's word. So what do missions do, right? We got this thing now. Now we got missionaries. Now we're we're organized. We're ready to go. Now what? Are we gonna go like teach people how to be better, how to be Americans? Like we're gonna go bring water? Like like what are we doing when we get there? Saul and Barnabas set sail to Cyprus. And it says that when they arrived at Salamis, what did they do? They proclaimed the word of God. That's it. If you want to know what missions is all about, if you want to know what the missionary heart of God is, it is about declaring the word of God. People can believe it. That's it. Right, they arrive at Salamis. Salamis, by the way, was on the eastern coast of the island. So uh, they, they arrive on the east coast. The, Salamis was also the former capital of Cyprus. It was destroyed in AD 15 by a massive earthquake. And then um, Augustus, Caesar, rebuilt the city. And it remained the largest city on the island. It was the location of a really large Jewish population that had its own synagogue. And so when Saul and Barnabas arrived, they go directly to the synagogue and they declare the word of God to people who need to hear. The focus of their mission's work is clear. Share the gospel of Christ. They move across the entire island from east to west proclaiming the gospel until they reach the western coast and the new capital of Cyprus, which is Paphos. All along the way, Declaring the word of God. Declaring the risen Christ. The power to forgive. It's a far cry from what many Christian organizations, churches, and even missions agencies believe their missions do today. They don't, they don't even want the purpose of their mission to be about telling people that they are sinners and that God is going to judge them if they don't repent and trust Jesus. Right? Because... That doesn't get a lot of positive press. It doesn't sound very nice. It's kind of embarrassing and, and feels unkind. We want people to think good things. But I'm afraid it's a far cry from what many Christians believe themselves about their own fundamental purpose or mission. I'm afraid for us as individuals, our priorities get, they, they kind of give us away here, right? Because I think if we were asked, we would all know what the correct answer is. What's your mission in life, Christian? What's your purpose for being here? Well, I'll just glorify God, right? And just enjoy Him forever. We, we know the catechism. And my purpose is to bear the good news of Jesus, right? That we know the right answers. But for how many of us do our priorities in life give us away? How much does our disinterest in actually evangelizing give us away? How much does our lack of interest in worship and fasting and praying give us away? When they arrive at Paphos, two things become evident about gospel mission. So far, this has all been great, right? Like the church is praying and fasting. It's fantastic. The missionaries being sent out. The gospel is being proclaimed in foreign lands. People who maybe have never heard before. Two things become very clear. When the church catches the mission's heart of God, we can expect resistance to that mission. 
Resistance is inevitable to this mission. But you can also expect that conversion is also inevitable. They make their way through Paphos. They come across a man named Bar Jesus. Really interesting name. It means son of Jesus. Son of Jesus. Now, how interesting is it? I don't know how this guy got his name. I don't know where that came from. But how interesting is it that these two missionaries sent out by the Spirit, commissioned by Jesus' church to share the message of Jesus, first encounters resistance by someone named the Son of Jesus. Right? It's like right off the bat, you meet this guy, like, this is not going to go well. Right? There's a problem. It's like when you're watching a movie, right? I don't know if it's so much these days. Remember the old movies, like the Westerns? You always knew the bad guy because of the black hat, right? Like, this guy's name is the black hat. Like, you know what he is from the get-go. His other name, the passage tells us, is Elemis. Elemis means wise, magic man, magician, which means he's probably some sort of a court astrologer. His job description would have read something like something like this, right? Uh, seeking someone responsible for the well-being of the proconsul. Must be well-versed in the healing arts, able to interpret weird dreams, proficient at finding and reading spiritual signs wherever they may appear, and must have a working knowledge of amulets, incantations, and other magical formulas, right? This was a guy who was syncretistic in his religious beliefs, as Rome was. And so the proconsul's like, it'd be helpful to have one of these guys around just in case, right? Like, he might be helpful. I might get sick and need someone who can do some magical stuff and, and heal me. Or I might have a weird dream. That happens to rulers in the Bible, right? And, and, and you need someone to interpret the dream. So let's have this guy, son of Jesus. Jesus did some pretty amazing things, right? I heard rumors about what he did. He apparently has some power. He apparently has some ability. Now, can we just ask the question real quick? What's wrong with magic? What's wrong with it? We, we, we read magic in the negative terms in the scripture all the time. Does this mean that when you watch David Blaine on TV and he's like doing these, you know, card tricks, sleight of hand, you know, are, are we watching satanic work? I, I think there's something different when the Bible talks about magic than sleight of hand. It's not just trickery or illusion. Magic was a form or, or a way to manipulate gods and spirits to get them to do what you want them to do. If I get this amulet, if I, if I say the right incantation, if I hold this thing, if I, if I mix everything just right, I can produce magically the answer that I'm looking for. I can call spirits to do my bidding. It's a form of control. Now, I think sleight of hand was probably involved. I think trickery was probably involved in order to lend the idea that I have this ability. I sell you on my capability. Was there demonic power involved? Probably. In at least some of the cases, some of these men seem to show legitimate power. Think of the, 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 the men in Pharaoh's court. Right? They throw their staffs down. They become serpents just like Aaron's staff. Some sort of power, some sort of ability. But folks, the God of the Bible does not take kindly to some peon like me chanting over some shiny red crystal in order to get what I want out of him. And what does God say? You don't have because you don't ask. Not because you didn't say the incantation correctly. It's not because you got the spell wrong. That's not how I work. I sent my son to die under a curse so that you could be free to simply ask. And I, as your good father, will give to you in abundance what you need. You need magic. You need incantations. Father. But this wise man, the son of Jesus, 
opposes Saul and Barnabas, probably because his boss, the proconsul, had invited him over, right? The proconsul's like, I want to hear what these men have to say about Jesus. Now, what does that do to what does that do to bar Jesus job security? If this man comes to understand that Jesus is the Savior of all men, and that through Jesus we have access to the Father, we are made right with our Heavenly Father, what do I need of a magician anymore? If I suddenly am in relationship with a God who is sovereign over all the earth, and He is my Father, I don't need magic. He's probably out of a job, right? So he starts to protest. He, he's in the proconsul's ear. By the way, proconsul, was, he was like the governor of the entire region. Rome would put a proconsul in an area that didn't need like a permanent uh, army occupation. So Judea, Israel, didn't have a proconsul. Why? They needed military presence. Th those people weren't always on their best behavior under Roman authority. Cyprus, fine. No issues here. You get a proconsul. He just kind of heads everything and, and takes care of things himself. He's a pretty important guy on this island. He's like the governor over the island. I love how it describes him, by the way. He says his name is Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. It's almost like he's contrasting him with this wise man, so-called wise man, Bar Jesus. Sergius' true intelligence is seen in that he is open to hear the gospel of Jesus while Elymas tried to persuade him against Jesus. Reminds us of the Proverbs, doesn't the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? Fools despise knowledge and instruction. And the scripture says that Saul was also called Paul. So there he's like, you've been waiting week after week, haven't you? Like, I've been calling him Saul week after week because that's what's in the scripture. And you've been wondering, when in the world did this whole Paul thing come in? Here it is. Why? It wasn't because God all of a sudden gave him a name change. It's because Paul is his Roman name. Saul is his Jewish name. And where is he going to be for the rest of his ministry? He's in, in, in Roman territory. He's going to be with Gentiles. Right? He's going to become all things to all men so that he might win some. Right? And that includes, I'm going to go by my Roman name and not my Jewish name. And so now Luke switches and starts using the Roman name of Paul. So Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, all right, which means this is now a showdown, not between Paul and Elymas, but between the Holy Spirit and the forces of darkness at work in and through Elymas. Then it says that Paul looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Now, how's that for evangelism 101? Right, can you imagine? Can you, can you imagine going out with someone this afternoon, someone else from the church, and like you come across someone, and, and, and they start sharing the gospel, and, and, and the friend of this person is like, ah, oh, man, that's garbage. You don't need to listen to that. That's, nah, man. And, and, and I don't know, like, like you're, with, you're with John, and all of a sudden John looked over that person and was like, you son of a what? And you're like, oh, goodness, all right, I'm out. All right, like I'm, I'm looking. Forget son of Jesus. You are son of the devil. Oh, enemy of righteousness. Full of all deceit and villainy. Man, you're looking for the nearest exit, right? Like John has lost it. I don't know what he's got going on, but I'm out, right? We're going to get ourselves shot. And that's where to share the gospel is. But Paul under the direction of the Holy Spirit, has some pretty hard things. Why are you making crooked the straight path of the Lord? The straight path of the Lord is Jesus. The straight path of the Lord is Jesus who came to save sinners like you and like me. And we enter into that salvation by faith. That is the straight path. And anyone who would say anything otherwise is making crooked those straight paths and are in that sense a son of the devil, seeking to condemn people. Verse 11, it says, And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be brought to be able to see the Son of the Father. And immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Why blindness? Blindness is a picture, a 
spiritual reality and that is that all of his wisdom and for all of his good purpose Paul says no Paul likely would have remembered his own experience as well in fact he was twice and he was blindly told that why I believe so that God can teach him the spiritual realities this is your condition as a Christian this man is truly blind I can't help but wonder if Paul had elements in mind when on the second Corinthians chapter four, the first few verses he says, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful and underhanded ways. Right? Forget magic. We've renounced that. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But with the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. This is the condition of those who are separate from Christ. They are blind, regardless of their abilities and regardless of their earthly wisdom and regardless of their wealth or power or influence. Apart from Christ, there is nothing but blindness. resistance to the gospel is inevitable. But the power of God can stop the mouths of those that shout us down and try to prevent the gospel from being shared. And why should we not expect resistance? Now, they resisted Jesus all the way to the point of his own death. By the way, what did he, how did he respond to that? He pitied them. Father, forgive them. Do not know what they are doing. I mean, why? They are blind. Blind deserve to die. You say, well, Paul didn't pray. And Paul is like, I'm making you blind, right? Son of the devil. But folks, it was mercy for this man who was so full of self deceit to be shown through a temporary physical blindness the reality of his heart's condition. This was a mercy of God to expose the reality of what was going on in Elemis' heart. Far better to be physically blind, even permanently, than to remain in your spiritual blindness. Right? Remember Jesus, Matthew chapter 5, 29? If your right eye offends you, cut it off. It is far better for you to enter into that blind than to be cast into that deep darkness. Spiritual sight far more crucial and critical than physical sight. Resistance is inevitable. So is conversion. Verse 12, the council believed. When he had saw what had occurred, he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. What I find most astonishing about this verse, it's, it's not that Sergius believed, but I think what we're all tempted to think is that, hey, you know what? If I saw a man struck blind, I would have believed too, right? Well, listen, we're not told whether Elymas ever believed or not. Isn't that remarkable? Here's the very man receiving this cursed judgment, and we don't know how he responds. By all accounts, he never believes. So don't think for a second that if God were to show up today and strike people blind, that all of a sudden everybody would be believing. The truly astonished, astonished Sergius was not the judgment miracle, but it was the teaching about the Lord, right? He was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. He heard the gospel of Jesus, and he was blown away by it. He'll forgive my sin? I don't have to do magic? Like I don't have to work for it? He just does it. That blows me away. Because this is the missionary heart of God to spread the amazing news that salvation is available and it is free thanks to Jesus. And all that is required is that you come to him, repent of your sins, and follow him. Guess what? It's not hard. I don't know. It seems so hard. Nothing embarrassing. Guess what? 
the reason is the strength. Savior. God, what a blessing. That will blow us away every time we hear it. Because we are called to be this missionary part of the gospel. A mission that centered the gospel message. Sharing his word to people who could hear it. Begs the question this morning, what are we all about? Maybe we want to alleviate suffering and poverty and this, and that's fine. But it is not missions work unless we are speaking the gospel. And that is why it's free. Engaging this mission is, is an invitation to war. There's going to be resistance. There will be conversions. They will be met with opposition. Folks, it's not enough for us to sit idly by waiting for the fight to come down. We're already more than conquerors through Christ. Our enemy is defeated. Now is the time. This is the moment to engage in this war. He is done. He is finished. He is powerless. Now is the time to fight. We don't like war because we go into war with an unease. Like we don't know how the end is going to be. We don't know whether our life will be lost. But this war we are entering into, the victory has already been had. Now is the time to engage. And folks, I don't think the church is ready to engage this kind of fight unless, number one, they're already engaging their own community with the gospel. Acts chapter 11, right? This church in Antioch already engaged in this battle in their own backyard. They were taking the gospel to the Jews. They were taking the gospel to the Hellenists. In their own backyard, they were going to war. They were taking territory. Not willing to sit back and wait for persecution. Not willing to sit back and wait for God to just drop something in your lap to do. Not waiting for someone to run up to you in the aisle of public to say, What must I do to be saved? This happens occasionally. I've got a cousin, man, and it is sometimes it blows my mind the things that happen. I never forget the story. He's in Winn Dixie. Some woman's crying in Winn Dixie. He's like, "Hey, are you okay?" And she's she's just like, "Gospel, I need gospel, right? Like I need God." Winn Dixie. It never happens to me. <laughs> but yet sometimes we act as if the mission heart of God, like we're just sitting back and waiting on those types of opportunities. Engage in the mission right here in our own backyard. It's not just about waiting on, on God to raise up other missionaries so we can send more to Peru or, or to Africa or to China. No, it, it's about right here, right now. It's time to engage the mission in our own backyard. I don't think the church is ready unless we're engaging in our own community. And I don't think we're ready for this kind of fight unless we're earnestly seeking the Spirit's help. What is the evidence that we are earnestly seeking the Spirit's help? Well, in, in this church, it is worship, it is fasting, it is prayer. How are we doing? How are we doing? And by the way, they were doing those things together. Three together. Listen, I think, I can speak for all of us here, the work is great. There's something we love about Sunday morning. There's something we felt was missing when it was just all digital and online. This is fantastic. It's inconvenient, right? It is not convenient. I see you walking in here in the morning, rubbing your eyes. You know, your kids, anything like mine, like hairs everywhere, right? Like, like I know, okay? It's not convenient. Especially when you're called to do it together. Nothing about corporate worship, corporate prayer, prayer is convenient. And don't you think that I would have just loved to, to have basked in the glory of all this college football last night rather than prepare a sermon? It's inconvenient. Don't you think that Mike and all the other people in the, in the music and in the ministry find it inconvenient to plan and to practice and to pray? 
wouldn't it be way more convenient to catch a sermon on your lunch break or over coffee or on your couch and get dressed and drive it here? Worship is inconvenient, yet we do it because God calls us to do it and because the Spirit leads us through it. And if Sunday morning worship is inconvenient, prayer meeting is even worse. And who wants to carve out time in the middle of the week to come and pray together? And that is really inconvenient. And listen, I, I hate, I don't want to lay extra burden on people that the scripture doesn't lay. I understand Sunday morning, that's like the prerequisite. Like that's the requirement God says, don't, you must do this, right? So that's a requirement even for membership here. We don't require anything else for that. I'm aware that Wednesday nights are legit hard. Okay, I get it. One of the blessings about having been in bivocational ministry for seven years is that God has burned into my memory just how much I dislike Wednesday night prayer meetings. Okay? Not that I don't like gathering with you. I love it. I love the prayer. I love it when we get here, but I do not like planning for it. I do not like coming to it. Right? It's inconvenient. So we're really high degree. It's one more thing, right? I was we're done with Wednesday night for a while, right? Now we're going to Sunday, life group, trying something a little bit different. Sunday, early afternoon. And it's going to be inconvenient. It might cut into football. It might make lunch harder. It might take away from my nap time or my beach time or my tea time or my me time. It's going to be inconvenient. But folks, what is your priority? Why are we here? Why are we in holiday? Why are we gathered? What, what, what does God want of us as his people? Is it so we can just grow bigger and wealthier and more comfortable? Or, or are we here for purposes of God's gospel and of his kingdom? Because if those are the reasons we're here, then it's going to feel at times inconvenient. Because his will is going to conflict with our desires. We're not always going to look forward to it. Here's how it is. Church, 2021 is almost over. I don't, I don't know if you, like, it seems like we've left and like we're still trying to recover from 2020 and now like 2022 is, is, is in our rear view mirror. Man. And it is, it is coming fast. Another year is almost coming and gone. And we're getting more organized than ever. And we're, 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 like, we're like this close to actually having a full-time staff meeting. Right, that, that's, that's an organization like we've not had in the past. What else? What does the Lord want from us? How much are you willing to inconvenience in order to find out? Will you fellowship and worship together? Will you pray together? Will you fast? You say, oh, no, wait a minute, right? Jesus said, you shouldn't let anybody know when you fast. Ha, gotcha, right? You should go in your closet and don't tell anybody, right? But listen, he doesn't mean that no one can ever find out, right? It doesn't mean that you can't do it together. The church in Antioch was doing it together, right? They all knew. What did Jesus mean? Jesus was driving at the motivation, right? Are you doing this just so you can tell people, so people will think that you're a really spiritual person? Then you might as well not do it at all. Right? You want to test your motivation? Do it when nobody knows. But he's not saying you can't do it together. The church did it together. What does God want from us? What's next? How much are you willing to inconvenience? Thank you.